Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for how you've been sending your own children, servants, ministers to minister to us and to teach us your word. We are praying, O Lord, that our spirit will use the heavenly pen to write all these things on the tables of the hearts of all of us in Jesus' name, that these great truths we are receiving will not be in vain. We pray, O Lord, the power, the courage, the boldness to carry out everything like you have given to us. You grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray that as we come to the study of this chosen epistle, we pray, O Lord, you'll grant us that grace to go all the way with you in Jesus' name. You have brought us this far. We cannot look back. We will not look back. But we pray that you'll take us all the way to the final destination in Jesus' name. We come to this important chapter in the epistle to the Philippians. And we pray, O Lord, you open up everything to your own children so that we'll become more intimate with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we look at this chapter, may we know you, know you more, and the power of, of your resurrection. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. We come back to our study of the epistle of Paul to the Philippians. We've gone through chapter 1 already, and we've gone through chapter 2. If you have noticed anything as we have looked at the chapters, you will see that the chapters have been full of Christ. On the one hand, we have Christ exalted, and we have Christ manifested for every one of us to see. And then we also have joy on the other hand. And this joy we have in Christ. And you'll find that every chapter talks about the joy. And every chapter talks about uh, the Christ. And this chapter in particular is full of Christ. As you look at the chapter just reading through, without even much study as such, you'll find it says in verse 3, Rejoice in Christ. And then he moves on to verses 7 and 8, and he says, I'm counting all things lost for Christ. And then he moves on in that same verse 8, he wants to seek, he wants to have the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And still in verse 8, he's saying, I want to win Christ. I've got a lot of things, and I'm looking forward to winning the crown. But the crown will be nothing to me if I do not win Christ, that I may win Christ. In verse 9, he wants to be found in him, that is found in Christ. And still in verse 9, he wants to have the righteousness that comes through the faith of Christ. And then he also wants to know him more that I may know him in verse 10 and then in verse 10 he wants to know the power of Christ's resurrection and he goes on he wants to have a fellowship the kind of fellowship communion sharing that is in Christ's suffering he even wants to be made conformable unto Christ's death and then in verse 12 he says I'm apprehended of Christ and then he now tells us I press toward the mark of the eye calling, still it's in Christ. That's in verse 14. And then he will not stop talking about Christ. He tells us, he's warning us of the examples of the enemies of the cross of Christ. And he affirms that we're looking for Christ, so we'll come from heaven and we'll fashion our bodies like unto Christ's glorious body. As you just go through, without study, you find that you are learning about Christ here. And you're looking at Christ there, and you want to be full of Christ, and you want your thoughts, your mind, your desire, your ambition, all to be taken up by Christ. It's in this chapter you will find particularly that the apostle, by his own example, as well as by exhortation, 
is calling all believers to a holy ambition in Christ. But the central truth is what you find in verses 13 and 14. Chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Then it says, I'm reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's why we title the study of this chapter, Pressing Toward the Mark. Pressing toward the mark. He starts in verse 1, by the word or with the word brethren. And these brethren are to rejoice in the Lord. He's been talking about the theme and the subject of joy. He still mentions the same thing here, but for the first time, he emphasizes, underlines that the joy is to be in the Lord. And then as he continues, he ends up, he says, if you will start with joy and continue with joy, there is the climax of that joy, the thing that will cap it all. It is when Christ will come, that's in verse 21, and he will fashion our own bodies unto like unto his glorious body he will change he will transform and then he will subdue all things unto himself and will be forever with him verse one he mentions our joy in christ and in the final verse he mentions the crowning joy the climax of all joy that we will have and in between those verses in between verse 1 and verse 21, he now tells us the kind of desire you ought to have, the kind of ambition you ought to have, the kind of lifestyle you ought to have, the kind of commitment, consecration you ought to have. If you are going to move on from that verse 1 onto the final end in verse 21, when you'll be transformed and changed and fashioned unto his likeness. And he tells us in those verses, that the great privilege of being totally conformed to him and the great privilege of being fashioned like unto his glorious body is not for the nominal churchgoer and it's not going to be for the religious churchgoer and it's not going to be for the cold and the lukewarm and the inconsistent stagnant christian such a hope such ambition and such a desire will not be realized by the people that are self-satisfied or self-sufficient or the people that are spiritually idle that they are not people that just say we're christians and which wait, we're waiting for the rapture no it is not for those who hate the cross who detest suffering in christ but they are for the people that actually reach forth for the mark of the high calling and they are pressing on and they are moving on and they want to have every time an addition to their christian life so that they'll be more and more and more like christ every day he's telling us one thing in one sentence it takes a great pursuit to win the great prize it takes a great pursuit to win a great prize and as we look at this chapter we're going to divide up the chapter as usual so that as we break into bits we'll be able to understand better number one the peril of religion without christ the peril of religion without christ and here paul the apostle he speaks from personal experience and what he had experience he now penned he now wrote down by inspiration number two purity and righteousness through christ purity and righteousness through christ and then number three he now brings forth the great pursuit reaching forth in christ the great pursuit reaching forth in christ we go to number one the peril of religion 
without Christ. I'm reading to you now from Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you, it is safe. Here he is telling us that he's going to make some repetitions. He was going to tell the Philippians, I'm writing some things to you now. And when I was with you preaching to you directly face to face, I had told you, you had had this thing from me. And therefore I'm writing the same things to you you heard before. But that to me indeed is not grievous. And to you who are believers, it is not grievous that we're writing the same thing. And I'm still going to hammer the same thing of peril, the peril of religion without Christ. Because there'll be people there, he was telling them in a way, in the congregation, that are religious, as religious as I was many years before. And yet, they do not have Christ. And therefore, I need to repeat this truth, even though you believers will know it, to repeat it is not grievous, because there's a sinner there, there is a church goer there, there is a religious fellow there that needs to hear this. And then he says to you, to you who are born again, to you who are children of God, this is safe. This is healthy. This is necessary. That for us who are believers, when you hear a message you had before, don't say, I've known that before. I read that before. He preached that before. He said, it's not grievous to make some repetitions. And it is uh, not unnecessary. It's not a worthless thing to make some repetitions. In fact, it is sound. It is safe. It is necessary. It is healthy. We need to do that. Then it says, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of concision. Uh, you must understand that uh, Paul the Apostle, as he was inspired of the Holy Ghost, uh, to write all these things now, he used his normal training, he used his observation, he used everything around him to write to the people. And you know, the old, in the olden days, in, in that world, uh, the cities were not well developed. And so you will find that the dogs will be roaming about the streets. Just like you'll find in some villages today. Not only that, those dogs will be picking whatever they, they wanted on the ground. And many times, those dogs were wild. And look at Paul the Apostle now. He looks at the Judaizers that were going from province to province. He looked at the religious people going from place to place. And then in writing to the Philippians, he said, Have you seen those dogs on your streets? And you are likely to think about the wild scavengers that are picking those dirty things from the ground. He said, Have you seen those dogs? They are wild. Have you seen those dogs? They can bite. Have you seen those dogs? Uh, it's uh, very dangerous to get near them. He was telling them that the Judaizers were like the dogs, roaming about in the streets, going from uh, province to province, and they are wild, and they will bite, and they will not give you any truth. Then it says, beware of evil workers. He was talking about those Judaizers who carried a lot of religion, Religion without Christ, religion without salvation, religion without righteousness, and they call them workers, so they are. But you know there are different kinds of workers. As you look at the Bible, there are workers of iniquity. There are workers of evil. And therefore it says, just being a worker is not enough. Being a preacher is not enough. What kind of workers are they? They are workers of evil. Beware of evil workers. And then it says, beware of concision. Now you are familiar with the word circumcision. And Paul, the apostle, wasn't going to use that word circumcision. He was going to use the word, another word, concision. Because uh, there was, uh, there really is a contrast between those two words in the Greek. The word circumcision means to cut around. But now, Paul the Apostle, he was talking about the people actually, you've heard about them, they went to the churches of Galatia. 
and he was saying you must be circumcised again get back to the law of Moses and so you have these Judaizers and they were going to the Gentiles going to the people they say if you really want to be saved you want to have assurance you want to have confidence that you are saved get into circumcision and now Paul the apostle instead of using the word to cut around he used the word concision which in the original Greek means to cut down to cut off and it means to mutilate he said the Philippians have you heard about those pagans worshiping their idols and then when they get frenzied up tensed up then they begin to use sharp instruments and they begin to mutilate their body that's what he was saying he said these Jewish people now after Christ has come after Christ died on the cross and were to look up to Christ and be saved and they're still saying that you will go through circumcision before you can be saved he said it's not even circumcision now because you see the period of the token of the covenant old covenant that is past the circumcision now is no more the cutting around it is not the cutting up it is not the cutting down it's not the mutilation of the pagan religion and that mutilation and that concision is as worthless in fact dangerous as the religions of the pagans that's why he said philippian believers beware of the concision now he says for we are the circumcision do you see that he leaves the concision it's like a nickname he gave to them and now he says we we who know the lord we are the circumcision because now our hearts are circumcised and something has been cut away from our heart the old nature the adamic nature the sinful nature uh, the, 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 the sin that propels us to do evil that has been taken away we are the people that are really circumcised the circumcision that the judaizers are all taking about you know that's just religion without righteousness we those who are born again we whose sins are blotted away we who have experienced salvation in christ we who have known the lord we who have submitted ourselves to the oppression of grace and to the oppression of the spirit of God we who are following the new covenant and we have the seal of the new covenant we are the circumcision and what's the evidence of that we worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and we have no confidence in the flesh all the demonstration of the flesh all the manifestation of the flesh all the fleshly religion the judaizers are carrying about it says we have no confidence in them anymore you know why because we have not come into christ and christ is the end of the law to those who are saved by faith and now to tell them how useless how worthless that religion without christ is he gives them something about himself and he mentions seven things from verse 4 he says though I might have confidence in the flesh he says if any man thinketh that he has whereof that he might trust in the flesh I am all now he's challenging the Judaizers he's seen all these people that are preaching circumcision and they are preaching salvation by circumcision in our days now salvation by infant baptism salvation by adult baptism salvation by giving money to the beggars salvation by self-righteousness salvation by holy communion salvation by belonging to a particular church salvation by denomination salvation by the things you can do for yourself trying to buy salvation he said if anybody will glory in anything like that i am all if any other thing cares that he has whereof he might trust whereof he might boast whereof he might have confidence in the flesh i am all then he gives us seven things number one circumcised on the eighth day number two of the stock of israel number three of the tribe of benjamin number four or uh, an hebrew of the hebrews number five as touching the law a pharisee number six concerning zeal persecuting the church number seven touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless and then in verse seven but what things were gained to me those i counted lost for christ you know what he was saying he was saying that all the things that those Pharisees, 
and those Judaizers and the circumcision party, all the circum all that the circumcision denomination will be talking about today, I could talk about them. I experienced them, but you know what I discovered? That they are dunk and they are draws because they will not save the soul. Actually, if the children of Israel, if they had been listening intelligently, they would have known that they were told the same thing in the Old Testament, that it is more than external religion. For you to please the Lord, for you to uh, really say you are a true worshiper, it is more than having external religion. In Isaiah chapter 58, Isaiah chapter 58, and in verse 2, it says, Yet they seek me daily, and delight to know my ways, as a nation that did righteousness, and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice, and they take delight in approaching to God. If you read verse 2 alone, you will think that these were true worshippers, that they loved the Lord. They were following the right way. They were serving the Lord. And the Lord was pleased with them. You will think everything was fine if you only read verse 2. But look at verse 1. Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgression. And the house of Jacob, their sins. If you omitted verse 1, you'll think they were doing well. The same thing if you look at some religious people today, and you look at the external religion, and you look at their morals, and you look at their refinement, and you look at the things they portray as religion. If you didn't go back, to look at the verse 1 of their lives, to look at the internal kind of nature that they still possess, and to look at the invisible part of their lives, you will think they were all right. In fact, if you hear some of their testimonies, as they talk about the Lord, as they talk about they are going to church, as they talk about how they were baptized in water, as they talk about the kind of church they belong to, and as they talk about the works of righteousness that they were doing, as they talk about their generosity in giving things to the people who are in need, you will think they were all right. But that's just external, and it is not enough. In Luke chapter 16, verse 15, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men you know religious people they have not been born again they have not been saved they justify themselves before men but god knoweth your heart it's not what we have in the head it's not what we manifest externally it's not the morals, the ethics we try to build up socially for people to think we are refined religious people. It says God knows your heart. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. In um, Luke chapter 18, let's listen to one of them. As he came to the temple... And then he was going to present his self-righteousness before the Lord. To him, he was uh, acceptable before the people. His religion to him was without blemish. But in the sight of God, he was miserable. In Luke chapter 18, verse 9, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. You realize that they are not trusting in God. They are not trusting in Christ. They are not trusting in the finished, accomplished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and he prayed thus with himself. He prayed like this with self-righteousness. 
self-satisfaction. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. He will not compare himself with the standard required by God. You require a required truth in the inward part. He will not compare himself with God's righteous demand. He will not compare himself with Christ, the Messiah. Because when you compare yourself with God's standard, you will see if you are falling short. When you compare yourself with Christ, you will see if you are falling short. He compared himself with other men. I thank you, God. I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. That publican happened to be very near. And you see there are people that will compare themselves with their neighbors and they look at their own religion and they look at the religion of the other fellow they look at their behavior they look at the behavior of the other fellow and they give themselves pass mark i've tried it all i'm doing it well i'm better than other men in fact in verse 12 i fast twice in the week i give tithes of all that i possess verse 14 i tell you the publican went to his house justified rather than the other, that is, rather than the Pharisee. You can see then the futility. You can see the emptiness. You can see the nothingness of religion without salvation. Religion without Christ. Religion without the righteousness that comes from Calvary, that flows through the blood of Jesus and flows into your life. In Proverbs chapter 30 and in verse 12, there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes. They are not pure in the eyes of God, they are pure in their own eyes. They are not pure in the sight of the angels of heaven, they are pure in their own eyes. They are not pure in the eyes of the redeemed of the Lord. When the redeemed of the Lord, those who are born again, those who are saved, those who know the high standard of the word of God, when they look at them, we know they are not pure. But in their own eyes, they are pure. And yet, it's not washed from their filthiness. The filthiness with which they were born. The filthiness that has followed them all through life. And they have not been purged. They have not been cleansed. They have not been washed from their filthiness. And yet they come with religion. And they are pure in their own eyes. The Lord is telling us not to think about that kind of purity. Because that will not satisfy the Lord. Because that will not make you to be in favor with the Lord. You need a cleansing that comes through the grace of God. If you are going to really be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Now let's come back to Philippians chapter 3. And let us try to see now what the apostle, what he was saying of what he had in the past. Look at it now from verse 5. Number 1, circumcised on the eighth day. And you see that was the joy and the boasting of the pharisees and of the jews of that time it was according to the law and according to the covenant that the almighty god had made with abraham but now when god enacted when god established the old covenant it had a time and he knew that the new covenant will come the old covenant now had been abolished the new covenant had been in place and this man was still rejoicing in the old covenant and that's sometimes what you find there are some people they can argue for many many hours and they will say i can tell you what we're doing is in the bible that's true the circumcision is in the bible the circumcision you'll find it in the old testament You'll find that that circumcision was a token, a sign of the old covenant. But the old covenant has now been abolished. And the new covenant has taken its place. Uh, it, uh, it will amuse you, although it will sadden you. When you hear some white garment uh, fellow arguing and say, I can show you 
burning incense, burning candle, I can show you in the Bible. Yes, you can show us. Is that in the new covenant? Did not come through Christ? Or are you following the thing that has been established? You can even find some people killing animals today, and they will say, I can show you in the Bible. Yes, you can. Is it under the old covenant that has been abolished, or is it in the new covenant that is established now for this generation? And you find some people that will say, you know, I can show you in the Bible. Where God says, when you come before him and you stand on that holy ground, you will remove your shoes. Yes, you can. That's in the old covenant or in the new covenant. You see many people, they do not understand. And Paul the apostle did not understand. And he said, I was circumcised. And that was his joy, his boasting in the olden days. But now he knew when he met Christ that what God required now was totally different. Number two of the stock of Israel and you know that Israel he inherited the covenant made with Abraham and now he's saying I am of the stock of Israel number three of the tribe of Benjamin now, if you read the Bible ordinarily it may not strike you what Paul was talking about Paul was saying now you people you need to realize if you are talking about Judaism if you are talking of being a Jew, you should understand that there are Jews, but there are real Jews. You see, when the ten kingdoms, the ten tribes rather, when they went into idolatry, Judah and Benjamin remained. And Judah and Benjamin, they remained loyal and faithful to the Davidic kingdom. And he said, Paul the Apostle said, if you are going to rejoice in religion, are you going to be greater than somebody coming from the tribe of Benjamin? In fact, don't you remember the first king in Israel came from the tribe of Benjamin? In fact, what was the name of that first king? Saul. Do you know my name? Saul. And so if you are going to rejoice that in Judaism, how about me? If that thing could have saved anybody, Judaism would have saved me. Then it says number four, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. See, at that time, the Hebrews themselves, the Jews themselves, many of them could not speak the Hebrew language. And then Paul, the apostle, is like he turned around, and now he might even want to speak to them in the Hebrew language. He said, well, when we have those Gentiles that are speaking Greek, we talk to them in Greek. Are you a Hebrew? Are you practicing Judaism? Are you a real pure Jew? And then he began to speak Hebrew. And then the other fellow said, I can't understand what you are saying. I can only take uh, uh, some things in Aramaic. He said, there you are. I am a pure Jew. If all these things could save, I will be saved before you. But being a Hebrew of the Hebrews could not save anybody. And then he said, as touching the law, I am a fundamentalist. You know, the, 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 the Pharisees were the fundamentalists among the Jews. Because you had Sadducees, they didn't believe the whole of the Old Testament. And you had some other people that had been affected by the amalgamation of all the ideas coming from the Gentile world. The Pharisees were the fundamentalists among the people of the Jewish race. And he said, if you are talking about fundamentalists, if you are talking about people that know religion, if you are talking about the people that take the Old Testament, who do you think I am? I am, a, I was a Pharisee. And so he said, but you know, all those things that I could have rejoiced in could not save me at all. Then he said, concerning zeal. If you had read anything about the Jewish people, you will see that they counted zeal as one of the high marks of a person that was really religious and he said concerning zeal persecuting the church and why did he give that as a quality because in defending judaism in defending the religion of the jews he hated anything that was different from the religion of the jews and he said being a fundamentalist even the people that will not follow the way of the pharisees i persecuted them number seven blameless in righteousness of the law not omitting anything you have to give tithe you have to give offering you have to have this washing you have to have that ceremony everything i did everything and yet he said all that religion could not save me 
you may want to write this now. There are seven things. Already I've read them to you, and I interpreted, I, I explained all those verses, but now one by one. Number one, rites and rituals. The rites and rituals of religion could not save. And therefore he said, I had confidence in that before. All the rites and rituals of the Jewish religion, Judaism, I had confidence in them. They couldn't save. Number two, the race. The race. That is, the tribe you belong to. The country you come from. The race that you belong to. He said, that pride, that I am a Jew. And you are Gentiles. And the Gentiles are meant to be firewood for hell fire. And we are the Jews and salvation is of the Jews. He said race could not save. And then number three, righteousness through the law. The righteousness that is produced on earth. The righteousness that doesn't have any heaven's touch. The righteousness that doesn't have cleansing in the blood of the Messiah. The righteousness that is only coming through you. He said all that cannot save. Number four, religion of our fathers. Uh, you know, I, I'm a Pharisee and Hebrew of the Hebrews. I ben a Benjamite, and not only that, an Israelite indeed, of the straw of the stock of Israel. He said, even that religion of our fathers, all that could not save. Number five, respect. Blindly accorded to the class you belong to. You know, Paul the Apostle, he belonged to a class, and he was a member of the Sanhedrin, we're told. And you know who I taught him, Gamaliel. And he said, you know the respect people give to the fundamentalists? You know the respect they gave to the Pharisees? I was in that class. And it wasn't a mean class when you consider religion. And yet he was saying, even that respect that you will give to that special class, that cannot save. Number six, readiness to spend all, even to die for religion. He said, I put my life in my hand, defending the religion of the Jews. And even that readiness to die could not save me, and it cannot save anybody. Number seven, recognition. Granted by your religious class, by your religious group, recognition that is granted unto you. You know what Paul the Apostle said? He said, I profited. In the Jewish religion, more than many my equals. I was recognized. And then he said, all that recognition was nothing. As we consider ourselves today. And you look at all the things that Paul the Apostle said, I could have rejoiced in. But he said, all those things could not save. Jesus is the answer. You want to be saved? You want to be right with God. You want to live a life pleasing unto the Lord. It's not self-righteousness. It's not religion. It is not the rites and the rituals. It's not the respect other people are giving to you. It's not the fanaticism, even readiness to die for religion. And it is not the recognition that people are giving to you. You must come to the Lord and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Only then can you be saved. And then your household will go to point number two. Point number two is dealing with purity and righteousness through Christ. Here he now comes, and as he comes uh, to this uh, part, he was not going to talk about uh, coming into Christ, knowing Christ, embracing Christ, believing Christ, being intimate with Christ. He says from verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted laws for Christ. He said, what things were gained to me? I counted those things lost for Christ. He was uh, using a kind of language here. It's like a seaman. And he's in the sheep. And he sees that the sheep is going to be drowned because of the storm. Then with his own hands to save his life and the lives of the people in the sheep, he casts away things that were precious before the storm. Things that he valued before the storm came. He now discards everything and throws them overboard so as to save life. And then Paul the Apostle says, I see myself in the sheep. And I see myself sailing. And I see that I was going to be drowned. And I saw that the load and the weight of religion 
and all those things I've had confidence in. And I saw that if I kept them in the boat, in the ship, in my life, I will be lost. Then he said, those things that were gained to me, that the other people recognized me for, that the other people res respected me for, all those things now I count but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. In verse 8, yea, doubtless, and I count all things. You know, in verse uh, 7, I counted at a point of conversion, at a point of meeting the Lord. In the past, that memorable day, I weighed everything, Christ on the one hand, religion on the other hand. And I looked at the things that profited me when I was in religion. And Christ was saying, but I'm the one that has established the new covenant that can cleanse you that can forgive you that can change your life that can save you and then i counted past tense all those things lost because of christ and then i became a christian born again real child of god but then it says now verse 8 yes doubtless i count present tense all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them, but don't that I may win Christ. It says, Here is my attitude now. I still count all things dung. Now, when he said dung, it was actually what he meant is garbage, useless things that I will put in the dustbin, refuse, human waste. That's what he was saying. All those things that are important to people now, all those things that religious people are carrying about, I count them as human waste that you'll not even want to touch with your hand. And that is so that I may win Christ. And in verse 9, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. It says, any time, I do not want to be found in self-righteousness anymore, in the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. There is a kind of righteousness which is of men by works. There is a kind of righteousness which is of men by religion. But he said, that one will not work. That one will not profit us. He says, the one that will profit us, the one that will link us up to the Lord, is that righteousness which is of God by faith. And then he says, that I may know him. Now you wonder, wait a minute here. Paul the apostle, he already knew Christ. He had met him on the way to Damascus, Acts chapter 9. And then not only that, he had been sanctified. Not only that, he had been filled with the Holy Ghost. Not only that, he had even been preaching. He had gone on the first missionary journey. Because I told you when we were treating chapter 1, that he got to Philippi in his second missionary journey. Think about a man who had known the Lord in salvation, in sanctification, in Holy Ghost baptism, in ministering, in preaching, and he had had the gifts of the Spirit of God, but now, after all that, after he even had established the church at Philippi, and writing back to them, he said, Philippians, you know my ambition? You know my desire? You know my aspiration? You know my pursuit? You know what I'm following after? You know what I'm reaching for to you? You know what I want now? That I may know him. Obviously, there is a level of knowing the Lord at salvation. Obviously, there is a level of knowing the Lord when you are sanctified. Definitely, there is a level of knowing the Lord when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Obviously, there is a level of knowing the Lord when you become a preacher and you experience miracles and a lot of things have taken place and you have gone on missionary journeys and then you come back now and you kneel down and you say, Lord, reveal yourself to me again. He was asking for intimate fellowship intimate relationship a closer link unto his lord that i may know him i pray that will be our prayer and then he says and the power of 
is resurrection. He knew a little bit of that already, but then he wanted so much more of the power of his resurrection so that in his own life, the power that will be working will not be power of the human skill, human energy, human authority, human understanding, but the power that rolled away that stone on the resurrection morning and the power that brought Christ from the tomb. He said, I want such a dynamic power to walk in my life. The power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering he had suffered for the lord already but he said i don't want just to suffer i want the suffering to lift me up with the lord and get me into a kind of fellowship the fellowship of his suffering you know what he was talking about oh he said anybody can suffer anybody can go through persecution anybody can be stoned but the kind of suffering i want is the kind that went they threw shadrach meshach and abednego into the fire then there was a fellowship they never had before you can throw anybody into the fire you can persecute anybody but he said when they threw them into the fire then christ the son of God, he came to them there and those people in that suffering, they had a kind of fellowship. They never had before. They were saved. They were believers in the Old Testament sense. They were living righteously in the Old Testament sense. They were pleasing the Lord in the Old Testament sense. And yet there was a kind of fellowship heavenly fellowship they had never had until they got into the furnace of nebuchadnezzar he said the kind of suffering i want is the one that will bring me into the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death he said that's the conformity that i want when i'm dead to all things and nothing affects my life interests my life anymore you know as you look at paul you'll find that number one con conversion brought him to christ that's very clear and as for everyone conversion brought him to christ but there's another word and this word is consecration that consecration kept him in christ two things conversion that will bring you to christ but it's not enough that conversion has brought you to Christ. There is something that will keep you in Christ. And that is consecration. And that's the consecration we find here. When he said, the things that were gained to me, all those things I count but lost. In fact, I'm still throwing them away. And everything, not that even some of those things were not even sinful. But if I see that, they will lessen my relationship, my fellowship, the enjoyment of the intimacy I have with the Lord. I throw them away consecration kept him in christ and uh, look at uh, what the bible is telling us in matthew chapter 13 and this is exactly what paul the apostle was experiencing in uh, matthew chapter 13 reading from verse 44 again the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field which when a man has found he hideth, and for the joy thereof, he goeth and selleth all that he has, and buyeth that field. You know, that's exactly the experience of Paul. All the things he had, all the things that were precious, all the things that were profitable, he gave up everything that I may win Christ. In verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man, seeking goodly pills, who when he had found when he had found one pill of great price he went and he sold all that he had and he bought it he gave up everything so that he could have he could win christ and that was the experience of that old testament character his name moses in hebrews chapter 11 you know when he was just an infant he had been found by the river bank by the riverside and then the daughter of pharaoh had adopted him as her own son and uh, that uh, daughter normally should have been heir to the throne but uh, being a woman in egypt they couldn't allow her to rule but if she had a son then that son will be able to rule but unfortunately for her she did not have any son of her own and now she adopted moses 
and called Moses her own son. And uh, Moses was schooled and trained, educated uh, to the highest level that any Egyptian raised in the palace uh, could have enjoyed. And then it came to the time when he could have taken over the rulership of Egypt. But then that Moses again, like, uh, like Paul, the things that were gained to me, I counted them lost for Christ. In Hebrews chapter 11 now, reading from verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And don't you know what was tied up to that? That means he could have the throne. That means he could reign. And uh, that was the most powerful kingdom, empire in the world at that time. He gave it up, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the slaves, the children of Israel, the people of God, than to enjoy the pleasures of season for a season, uh, the pleasures of sin for a season. There were pleasures to enjoy in the palace, but he counted them as pleasures of sin. To enjoy that for a season, that is, for the period they will live on earth. He said, no, I will not take that. I will rather choose another thing. Verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And that's what the Lord is calling every one of us to, that we will realize that you count the things that could have been gained to you, you count them as done. As you look about, as you look at Paul, the life of Paul the apostle, there was a definite change in his life. What kind of change? Number one, change of heart that was a change of heart that affected every area of his life number two change on the value he placed on things he knew how to weigh things he knew how to measure things he knew the difference between heavenly things and earthly things he knew the, the difference between eternal things and temporary things. He knew the difference between the things that will bring eternal reward and the things you just have on earth here for a short while and then it's gone. He had a change of the value he placed on things. Number three, he had a change of di direction and a change of activities of his life. He met the Lord like this, and that changed everything, even the direction in which he was going. Number four, there was a change of his company. He was in the Sanhedrin before he left that. He came to the believers, going in and coming out of them. He had a high position in the world before. He came to the despised disciples of Jesus Christ, going in, coming out of them. Number five, he had a change of thoughts. A change of desires, a change in his ambition. There was an ambition he had before, but when he came to know the Lord, all that ambition changed. And you will see the way he spoke, you will see what he focused upon. He had now put things of eternal value as number one in his life. He was now focusing on Christ, desiring Christ, thinking on Christ, meditating on the privileges he had in Christ. When you do that, if you'll do that today, if you will put eternal things or things of eternal value as number one in your life, if you will focus on Christ, if you will think of Christ, if you will desire Christ, if you will meditate on your privileges in Christ, that will make everything in life to take their real value in your mind, in your thoughts, in your aspirations. In short, he was dead to the things on earth and he became alive to the things above. Dead to the things on earth and then he became alive to the things above. I pray that God will do the same thing in every one of our hearts even today in Jesus' name. We come back to Philippians chapter 3. Now we have point number three. The great pursuit reaching forth in Christ. Now you, you cannot uh, spend uh, a day with Paul the Apostle without knowing the fire burning in his soul. You, can, you could not have spent a moment with Paul the Apostle without having something of heavenly treasure rubbing off on you. Everyone that met that man 
that came to that man, that saw that man, that fellowship with that man, and they got something of his life, something of his ambition, something of the pursuit of his soul. And you can tell it's still the same thing today. When you read uh, the epistles of Paul, and you see his life, and you hear his testimonies, something comes upon you. You know that uh, there is still a, a kind of level you need to get to. Look at his language now in Philippians chapter 3 verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, what? A man that had been saved, sanctified, because you are witnesses and God also is said, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe a man that had the power of the Holy Ghost in his life and when that about Jesus tried to oppose his preaching he looked at him and said you child of the devil and with heaven's authority coming out of his mouth he said you'll be blind you will not see the sun for the season immediately that man became blind look at this man saying with all I have got with all I have done, with all the places I've gone, not as though I'd already attained. Here is the man that had been taken to the third heaven, and he had been to paradise, and he had words, and he saw things that he didn't have human language to be able to explain. He saw some mysteries that he was not permitted to write down or to tell anybody. Look at a man that the Lord himself was backing up. He was in a sheep. And then they were all going to die. And the Lord sent an angel from heaven because of him alone and said, Paul, you are my servant. You will testify of me in Rome. And even all these people, more than 270 people, I give them to you just because of you. They will not die. Think about a man like this now telling us not as though I have in our language today modern day language not as though I have arrived you know many people today there is no pursuit in their lives there is no goal anymore there is no ambition anymore once they can testify I'm saved I'm sanctified I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost and I went somewhere and I prayed the gospel and see what happened finished no more goal no more ambition no more strategy no more planning no more aspiration they are satisfied they say see what god has done through me is that not enough here is paul not as though i'd already attained or either already perfect but i follow after if i may if that i may apprehend that for which also i am apprehended of christ jesus brethren I count not myself with all the things I've read about me to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Look at a man, a man of one single purpose. There was a focus in this man's life. It's like he had a telescope and he was looking at something very, very far away that other people could not see. And therefore he said, this one thing I do. Paul, what do you do? Forgetting those things which are behind. He said, number one, all my sins that I committed before I knew the Lord, I've forgotten about them. You know why? God himself has forgotten about them. All my victories of the past, I've forgotten about them. You know why? There's a new battle today. All my success of the past, I've forgotten about them. You know why? There is a soul to be saved today. I'm reaching forth, reaching out to him. And everything that people are rejoicing about, I put that in the record of God. When I finish a day, I forget that day. Whatever happened that day, I put that behind me. And this one thing I now do, I press forward, I forget the things that are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. And then it says, I press forward. It says, there is something within me that is pressing me. There is something within me that is a kind of pricking me. There is something within me that is agitating me energizing me stirring me up and moving me on he said i don't know about other people i cannot see down there is something churning me within turning within me there is something that is boiling within me there is a fire that is burning within me and because of that i keep on pressing toward the mark 
for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. After he has spoken about this wonderful ambition and this wonderful aspiration, then he looks around and he says, Should I be the only one that is pressing forward, forgetting the things that are past, designing just one thing to glorify the Lord, that I may know him, that I may possess that prize of the high calling? In verse 15, he calls upon everybody else. He said, You can do like that too. You can be like that too. Let us therefore as many as be perfect that means you have been born again that means you have been sanctified that means you have the holy ghost that means there's no blemish there's no blame there's no wrinkle in your life that means the blood of jesus christ has cleansed you let us be thus minded and if there be any and anything uh, ye be otherwise minded god shall reveal even this unto you nevertheless whereunto we have already attained let us walk by the same rule let us mind the same thing he said brethren be followers together of me he said brethren don't uh, write all this up that i may know him and press him forward this one thing i do i want to possess i want to know him more intimately don't say well that's paul the fanatic that's paul that's his constitution that's a predestination and that's what God wanted for him. Everyone has his own approach. Everyone has his own ambition. And that's Paul, not me. I would live my own life. Oh, he said, brethren, the same zeal you see here, the same aspiration you see here, the same fire you see burning here, and the same stirring you have observed, uh, stirring me up here, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as she have us for an example and then he said there are some people that have negative example don't look at them because if you look at them they are going to distract your attention because you see uh, the people that are having negative influence they have the way of uh, discouraging you demoralizing you making you to feel oh, what's the need why am I running after all this? After all, I'm not the only one in the kingdom. Look at this one, look at that one. Verse 18, for many walk, of whom I told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, who, whose praise, whose glory is their shame, who might as listening. So said you'll find that those people, and you'll find that number one, they are enemies of the cross of Christ. They depreciate the cross. They belittle the cross. They diminish the cross. They lower the cross. They even want to bury the cross. They don't want to talk about the cross. They are silent about the cross. They are the enemies of the cross of Christ. They are opposed to the cross. They do not want you to carry your cross, bear your cross, and follow Christ. They oppose it. They hate it. They detest it. Number two, whose end is destruction? These people, they are walking in the broad way. There's too much liberty in their worship. Too much liberty in their lifestyle. And there is no restriction. There is no self-denial. They are just for whatever will satisfy the flesh. That's what they want. Number three, whose God is their belly. Whatever they can get out of religion, that's what they are looking for. And if uh, what they will get from religion will increase, their stature will increase, the material things they have, that's their God. Number four, who glory in their shame. The things they should be ashamed about, they would even come to the public and be talking about it and bragging about it. Number five, it says they mind earthly things. They are not centered on heaven. They are not focused on heaven. It means they are not risen with Christ. They are not seeking those things which are above. Where Christ is seated on the right hand of God, they have not set their affections on things above but things on the earth. It says you don't be like that. You should be a person that is pursuing, a person that wants to have what the Lord has for you and you have that one goal one ambition in your life Psalm 27 Psalm 27 in verse 4 one thing 
have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. That's what the Lord is calling us to. And then he now tells us in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, for our conversation. Remember again that King James uh, English it doesn't uh, mean what it means now. Our citizenship is in heaven. That is, although we are here bodily, yet our treasure is there. Our name is in the register there. Our goal is there. And the destination, final destination is there. Our Lord is there. And our colleagues, some people who believe the Lord with us, when we believe, some of them are there. Our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior. Every day we wake up, we look up, we say, Lord, are you coming today? Well, the heavens open today, well, the sky open today, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive will be transformed and changed, and we'll go to be with the Lord. Every day we wake up, we are saying, the rapture may take place today, the taking up of the people of God may take place today, we're looking for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who when he comes, he shall change our vile body, we shall wear a new body because this corruption must put on incorruption and then it says it shall be fashioned unto like his glorious body according as the walking whereby is able even to subdue all things unto himself if you are a child of god i praise the lord with you you are going to take place you are going to take part in the rapture because any time from now our lord will soon come behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of god therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not beloved now are we the sons of god and it does not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when it shall appear we shall be like him we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure is there something in your heart looking up to heaven saying lord i don't have anything here on earth tying me down i'm waiting for the sound of that trumpet i'm looking for the sky to open I'm looking for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to appear there. And there's a connection between me and him. The magnet will take me off. And then I will leave all the earth behind. I'll be forever with the Lord. If that's the case, there's going to be a pursuit in your heart. A desire in your heart. And this morning, you want to tell the Lord, Lord, thank you for salvation. Thank you for sanctification. Thank you for Holy Ghost baptism. Thank you for the knowledge, intimate knowledge, personal knowledge I have about you. But now this morning, I want to know you more. I want to know you more. The power of your resurrection. I want to forget the things that are behind. I want to pursue. I want to follow after. I want to seize. I want to take hold. I want to forget everything of the past. I want to start afresh today. Reaching forth. For the mark of the high calling in Christ. Talk to the Lord in prayer today. Talk to the Lord in prayer this very moment. That you will not be a lukewarm Christian. Let the Spirit of God, the fire of the Holy Ghost, stir you up within. Don't be satisfied with what you have got, what you have done, what you have achieved, the prayers you have prayed, the experiences you have got. Reach forth reach forth reach forth don't be idle don't be lazy don't be lethargic don't be lukewarm don't be cold reach forth then you'll forget all the good good things you have done let there be a new consecration today let there be a new intimate knowledge of the lord today seek the lord seek the lord and be like that merchant man when you have discovered a good pill of great price, you bring everything that you have got in exchange for that good pill of great price. Reach forth to this mark of high calling in Christ. Let there be spiritual growth. Don't be stagnant. 
Don't remain in the same situation. Move on. Don't look back. And don't rejoice too much because of what you did yesterday. What have you done today? Move on. 